Yes. <laughs> Rob Van Dam. Listen to True Hill Heat. Pow. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. It is me, it is me, your True Hill Phenom, SP3. We are live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for True Hill Heat's A&E biography, Shawn Michaels Review. We are live right now to talk about the life and career of the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels, with the great A&E special that they did last night. I am back once again, another week, another A&E biography with the connoisseur of reporting himself. This man did such a great job running the show last night on our WrestleMania Backlash Roundtable Review with Top Guy JJ. He is the co-host of NX3. Uh, this is the co-host of True Rewind, the man, the myth, Romeo Anthony Colon. Can you tell I'm a little excited for this one? Just a little, uh, the in-ring goat of wrestling, Shawn Michaels. Let's do this. Yes, yes. And this is a quick reminder to everyone watching. We want to hear your thoughts on this episode of A&E Biography. So let us know in the live chat what you thought about this episode. Where does Shawn Michaels rank in the pantheon of great professional wrestlers? Do you consider him the WWE GOAT or the in-ring GOAT of professional wrestling? Let us know in the live chat. And of course, if you want to make sure you are you are included, you are a part of this show, show let us know by sending in those super chats those super chats help us dictate the conversation we want to know what you guys think so to be a part of the show send in those super chats of any monetization it could be a dollar it could be two dollars it doesn't matter you will be a part of this show if you send in the super chat if you're watching us on youtube give us a thumbs up share this video with all your wrestling fans friends and family on all your favorite social media platforms of course if you're watching on facebook or twitter drop us a like drop us a heart emoji a laugh emoji an angry emoji however this episode made you feel let us know by giving us those expressions and of course tag a friend so they can watch along with us and just just be a part of the party this is true hill heat it's all a part of our monetization celebration another live stream for you guys so romeo and a biography sean michaels one of your all-time favorites let's get into it uh, i like the way this started with 1995 sean michaels talking about the chip on his shoulder it's over footage of seeing 2020 Shawn Michaels working in NXT very humbly. Uh, so weird because not only do they physically look like two different people, they pretty much are two different <laughs> people. And that's pretty much the premise of this biography. They get into the two lives of Shawn Michaels. They had all I, the major I, players. I did enjoy how this was pretty much like in uh, in chapters. They told the story in chapters, which was different. And this was another one like last week with the Booker T biography we talked about with uh, Kelvin and Stag King last week that you could tell there was different producers or different directors with that one compared to the previous ones. This one, again, you can tell it was probably a different like producer or director on this one because of how they broke down the story. And the first chapter was Beginnings. Uh, they talk about his father being in the Air Force. What a what a great line of service. They moved around, settling in Texas. His last name got plenty of laughs in school. Hickenbottom. Uh, he loved football because of the contact. And the 12-year-old Michael Hickenbottom finds wrestling on TV, knows immediately that's what he wants to do. Ric Flair, whoa, seemed to be his favorite as a kid. They talk about a senior year of high school with his buddy. They put on a wrestling match for a talent show where Sean gets busted open. They finish second to cheerleaders. I was amazed by how many pics they had of him and his buddy with fake blood on their faces. They really were big time blood and guts marks. <laughs> they they set the industry back like 30 years, <laughs> even even 30 years ago. But uh, yeah, I, I, apparently from the, from the story his buddy told, the, the Michael's blood was a shoot. 
that he he slammed yeah. his head into like off the stage or something, and he really uh, had shoot blood. So yeah, I, I love the the old school pictures because it it showed you how much of a professional wrestling fan Shawn Michaels really was. Like when I was growing up as a kid, Shawn Michaels that that's was was one of the first things that made him very relatable to me as a fan is that he was such a fan even growing up, and that this whole boyhood dream that we would hear about years later it was definitely true. College wasn't for Sean. His friend thinks he had a 0.4 GPA. Sean tells his dad he doesn't want to waste any more of his time or money. He's going to be a pro wrestler. He meets Jose Lothario in San Antonio. And his dad spoke, this is old footage of his dad, uh, not, not wanting to uh, regret and looking at a, a 35 or 40-year-old son and having him say, Dad, if you just let me, I could have been a professional wrestler. His dad was pretty honest there. Yeah, and man, when they showed those pictures of his uh, dad when he was younger in the Air Force, god damn, he looked like Sean. Like, he looked like almost identical to Sean. Like, it was like no joke. I was like, is that Sean? And they're just not telling us. Was Sean really like, he had, he had three different lives? Like, he was born <laughs> in like the 50s because like his dad, his face was this like, identical to Sean's. And then you can even see it in his latter years. He looks like Sean does now. <laughs> they fast forward to present day. Shawn Michaels at home doing stretching to uh, get his body ready for the day. Uh, says he plans on getting knee and shoulder replacements to help his quality of life. He looked he looked in pretty good shape though, and he yeah. says uh, he, it's not like he got in this life saying he wanted to be independent, independently wealthy and one hundred percent healthy. I mean, I mean, this is not the life that you uh, get into if you want to be if you want to be healthy for the rest of your life. Uh, he was definitely in love with professional wrestling. Like you, you don't hear about Sean with too many like loves of his life early in his career. His one and only love was professional wrestling and uh, it seemed partying as we would get into. Yes, that's the next chapter. Bad reputation. Uh Oh, things are about to pick up. He starts in Mid-South Wrestling, Bill Watts' territory. And you can watch this stuff on Peacock. Well, I don't know about uh, right now at this moment on Peacock, but eventually if it's not uh, uploaded already. Shawn Michaels, an absolute greener-than-goose shit rookie. Quiet, humble, just wanting to learn in Mid-South Wrestling. And Watts sends him to Kansas City after six months to set him up to grow in the business. We hear from Marty Jannetty who looked a little bit rough. They meet. Did he ever? Did, did, <laughs> did Marty uh, look ever? Marty looked like he took a <laughs> couple of, couple of uh, enhancements to get himself ready for the camera. They meet. They click in ring. Opposite personalities. Uh, Bruce Pritchard mentions that being in the military family sort of protected you from some of the evils in life. Uh, Marty, said, uh, Marty says he was going to bring out another side of Sean, and that... He did, as they show, uh, they talk of a story, first line of blow in Las Vegas. <laughs> the, the, you got to love Marty Jannetty, that his first memory is the first line of blow him and Sean ever did together, and all the party. Like, like Marty, Marty, like, is grinning ear, for, for ear to ear, not talking about a professional wrestling match, not talking about how the Rockers got over. It was the partying. The partying is what brought so much joy to Marty Jannetty as a uh, talking head here, and we... we this was like kind of the first time because we've heard the story of the Midnight Rockers before, but we didn't hear about like their theme song. Like Marty goes into like the whole theme song by uh, Judas Priest and he like singing it and stuff. And how they really got the moniker was, uh, you know, they talk about Big Van Vader coming into the territory and saying, oh, I thought you said these guys are, are partiers. They're all like tired. It's only like nine, 10 o'clock. And, and then um, I, I forgot who, who it was that told Big Van Vader, but he basically tells them they don't get started until midnight and that's like they 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 would be right at home with us in new york romeo <laughs> <laughs> the midnight rockers of the awa they get exposed to a audience on espn they talk of the showdown at the showboat september 2nd 1986 fighting for the tag team championships and sean once again setting the business back 30 years blood and guts a defining <laughs> moment in their career early career uh, 
Absolutely. Like so much blood and guts in this early portion of this uh, biography. You would think that uh, Shawn Michaels works for AEW nowadays and not NXT with the amount of blood that he was squirting early on in his career. But I, I really want to go out my way to watch that match. That match is, so is a match that really, uh, like, he like they say, like put the rockers on the map. And um, it's a match that I've heard a lot about, but I've never been able to see. So it's definitely a match that I have on my bucket list of what I need to watch because the mid night rockers were ahead of their time uh they inspired so many other tag teams after them like the hardy boys the young bucks uh you know and they were inspired by the rock and roll express but they put their little their little unique spin on what the rock and roll express were doing at the time and that's what made the midnight rockers stand out in the awa 1997 wwe bound and uh, at the bar and they're pretty much saying that the the other talent on the roster you know it's not going to be easy to earn their respect. Marty tries to keep to themselves, but they're told, don't do that. You got to mingle. And Jimmy Jack Funk comes over hammering drinks and eating glass, pressuring Sean to do the same. Uh, some people say Sean or Marty threw a beer bottle that started a chain of events. Sean denies it. And in the wrestling business, these kind of stories get magnified tenfold. Rumors and innuendo, one might say. Oh, who would who say something like that? I think one of our talking heads here would say something like that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's it's sad that that kind of put a halt on their first run with the WWF. They're and, fired. Uh, they're they're fired. Says, one and done. You're out. <laughs> you, you're out of here. That's first impressions for you. First impressions are very important in life, but most especially in the wrestling business, it seems. And the Midnight Rockers did not make a great first impression with the WWF. They fast forward to 2020 NXT film session roundtable review, one might say. Sean picking apart NXT TakeOver 30 with guys like Ciampa, Gargano, Cole, Strong, Kyle O'Reilly in, in the room. That's pretty cool. Uh, getting Shawn Michaels yeah. to break down your wrestling match. Uh, that's like a dream come true for someone like a Johnny Gargano or Adam Cole or Damian Priest. Like you got one of the greatest performers in WWE history, one of the greatest performers in professional wrestling history, breaking down your action. Like, you know, Johnny Gargano would talk about it later when they're, uh, you know, going through the matches for TakeOver 30, that Sean is the master of the ladder match and to be having like his first major ladder match in WWE and have Sean be there to kind of, showed them what spots showed them how to tell this story using the ladder it's a great it's a great input that's why i love these additions of of present day sean and how much he's grown because i don't think that this early portion of his career sean would be able to recognize himself right now uh, another chapter second chance uh because marty and sean had burned their bridge at awa they end up in continental wrestling in birmingham alabama wrestling in front of 25 people for $300 a week. He would get paid $50 in cash and the other 50 in cocaine, which is what he probably did nine out of 10 times, he said. And they talk a little about how Marty had to go to be with his girlfriend sometimes, leaving Sean alone. And Sean would get these very low moments coming off the cocaine in the morning. And he said he was never honest about what he was doing with his parents. Like, yeah, of course, I, I wouldn't be honest with my parents either. <laughs> I would not tell my parents that I have a cocaine addiction. That's not what I would tell my parents. That I don't think that they would think that my decision to, you know, drop out of college and become a professional wrestler was a wise decision if I have a cocaine addiction because of that. Pat Patterson influences the Rockers to work on changing their reputation so they could come back to WWE. They come back on probation. And Taker mentioned something about they tested him with some of their antics, and they were both peckerheads. I had to look this up. What the hell is a peckerhead? Apparently, it's an aggressive, objectionable person. Seems legit. Yeah, Taker seemed, uh, Taker, when he used that terminology, I was like, man, you were even old back then. You, <laughs> you, you, you really were dead because you, you sound like you're in your fucking 70s now. Like, what the fuck? A peckerhead. Uh, the fact that you had to look it up. And you're a man that is known for many insults that you give other people or trolling other people. So the fact that you had to look it up says everything. <laughs> uh, a new one in my vocabulary what can I say uh, Hunter speaks of the style of wrestling changing into more athletic in ring work which fits the Rockers to a T we see Saturday night main event versus the Hart Foundation yes. Brett says he knew it was going to be five stars 
And then, wow, the rope breaks. Brett, being the veteran that he is, stalls, knowing it's taped. They'll, they'll, they'll just fix the rope. <laughs> They're told to continue without it. Brett says it was a disaster. The way they were talking about this, I want to see this match so bad. But guess what? The Rockers win. They're, they're the new champs, tag champs. It's their biggest moment. And, but the match was so bad, it never airs. And Vince just says, well, give the goddamn titles back to the Hart Foundation. This never happened. We're, we're going in a different, a different direction, pal. We're, it never happened. It never happened. The people won't know it. Oh, man. Just, just heartbreaking. Like, the Rockers will always, always go down in history as the greatest WWE tag team to never win the tag team titles. And that's just sad. With so many great tag teams, you know, up and down the from the 80s to the 90s to the early 2000s, not so much nowadays because Vince McMahon hates tag team wrestling. And you can see the seeds were planted here when he when this match got ruined. When he books a great a great match between two great tag teams and it gets ruined, Vince is like, "You see, you see, that's why I hate tag team wrestling. Break these two tag teams up, damn it! Give me a star, give me Bret Hart, give me Shawn Michaels, god damn it!" So yeah. <laughs> The seeds were all planted here. That's why Vince hates tag team wrestling now. That match, a lost moment in time. The next chapter, introducing the heartbreak kid. They talk a little story. Roddy Piper, uh, who we just did a biography on. Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty partying. Obviously not in the right frame of mind. And Piper talking. This is what we did we <laughs> from uh, the, 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 Piper, the Piper biography. This, was, this is why I said the Piper biography couldn't get a high, uh, higher score. I had to go back and give it a little bit lower because there was missing parts. They didn't talk about his, a lot of his drug use. And this right here already, we, we are showing that the, Shawn, that the Roddy Roddy Piper biography had some stuff missing out of it because we didn't know he was partying with the Rockers in like what, the early 90s, late 80s? Come on. Piper talking up Sean and talking down Marty as far as their singles potential goes. This leads to a fight between Sean and Marty in which Marty bleeds like a gutted pig. Right, he's stealing the pot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wild story that they go through very quickly. Um, Marty says Sean always told him that he wanted to be a world champion. Marty was like, okay, uh, we're tagging, so just let me know when you're ready for that. Don't spring it on me. And Marty says he sprung it on him anyways. I think, personally, uh, that was a bit too much whining and crying from Marty there. He should have known better. At, at least Sean let it be known from the start. I think he was, I think it was, I think it was what did you think? I mean, the, the seeds were being planted already. And so I think that, you know, he had months, like they showed the footage. I think their, their loss against the Nasty Boys happened at Survivor Series. And they didn't break up until January. So although probably when the story started, it probably was sprung on Marty. Marty had more than enough time to get himself mentally prepared for the final, you know, nail to be in the coffin. So I think that, um, yeah, it might be maybe a little bit of an embellishment by uh, Marty Jannetty, but I can understand because this is the peak of Marty Jannetty's career and it forever will would be like, this is the reason why if a tag team breaks up, one guy is successful and the other guy isn't, they are the Marty Jannetty. The one that doesn't is not successful is the Marty Jannetty. And it all starts here with the barbershop scene in January of 1992. We got in the comments real quick. Uh, Chris G saying drunk guy, JJ accepts those type of payments as well of cocaine and uh and beer and liquor. Shouts out to Drunk Guy JJ. Shouts out to Chris G. He did an excellent job on the Impact Under Siege solo review, not the round table, solo review. He was on his own and he did his damn thing. Thank you, sir, for putting in that work. But yes, I do I do uh believe that Drunk Guy JJ does take those type of payments. How about you? Oh man, it's way too early for this. <laughs> The breakup in the barbershop. Uh, I remember Brain just, this is so classic Brain. Oh, I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> no, no, right after he's like, ah, oh, man, they're, they're back together. Oh, I knew he was going to do that. Like immediately after. And then he, and then he's like, he's like, how dare Marty uh, throw himself into the barbershop window? And like, <laughs> just one of the greatest. Uh, Brain Rosenberg. Is, like the best, is the best heel commentator of all time, in my opinion. 
Peter Rosenberg calls it the greatest tag team breakup of all time. Marty says, Sean really laid in that super kick and he got me back for Denver. That, I didn't get that reference. I think Denver was where they had the, the fight in the hotel with, oh. uh, with Roddy Viper. Sean credits Marty for their strange relationship because without him, so much of the good doesn't happen for Sean. But in a tag team, there's a ceiling that he's trying to break out of. Yeah. Bruce yeah, it's Pritchard. Understandable. It's understandable to me. I get it. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Pritchard credits Sean for uh, mapping out the Heartbreak Kid character. Sean calls it Elvis meets Freddie Mercury. His mother hilariously uh, doesn't know where all that came from. Kevin Nash says his Kentucky waterfall mullet is one of the greatest mullets of all time. Uh, I think Eddie Guerrero was better. Um, it's close. It's close. I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's probably one of the biggest missed opportunities in wrestling history. Oh. Is we never got Shawn Michaels versus Eddie Guerrero. You, you, yeah, man. Especially because they were thinking about having that at uh, WrestleMania 22. How great that would have been. I mean, we, we, we got Shawn Michaels versus Vince, which was probably Vince McMahon's greatest match ever. But ah, Eddie versus Michaels, man, to, WrestleMania 22 would be looked at totally different if we got that match. Whenever someone asked me what's my dream match that never happened, that is my first one. Uh, immediately followed by Charlotte and Ric Flair. Uh, going on. <laughs> Sean says he could relate to Elvis and Mercury in the sense that he's so confident out there in the ring uh, for them on stage uh, in front of crowds, but that feeling isn't there when he's back in his hotel room. Interesting. I think I think like the the best high, and it's funny because I kind of watch uh, two documentaries back to back. I watched uh the icons documentary of rob van dam and then i watched this back to back and it's kind of something that van dam said it is that you know although both of these guys are known for like their drug use and extracurricular activities outside of the ring and these guys got high they did rob van dam in a much healthier way than Shawn michaels but i feel like the best high and the best addiction the, the addiction that they kept going back to was professional wrestling, and they never felt like they were always trying to recapture that high, and they never could outside of the ring. They talk about uh, Sean being the little guy in the land of the Giants. Bruce Pritchard said Sean may, may have been 6'1", but his ego and chip on his shoulder made him 9'5". Uh, Sean says he was the most dangerous person in the world because he had nothing to lose. And when you're like that in a creative world, you are unbeaten. This leads to WrestleMania 10, where that kind of creativity takes place. Uh, he had been suspended, failed a drug test for steroids, uh, which led to the suspension and the two IC champions because Sean wouldn't give the belt back. And they uh, talk about the WrestleMania 10 match. Sean loses but gains credibility in the eyes of fans everywhere. Yeah, there was no loser in that matchup. Both guys became legends on this night. Like Razor Ramon was a guy that kind of. Um, you know, Intercontinental title was his apex, it seemed, in the WWF. Like, they gave him, like, brushes at the main event scene. He had a WWF championship matchup with Bret Hart early in his run in January of 1993 at the Royal Rumble. But it seemed like the Intercontinental Championship was as high as WWF was going to give him as far as accomplishments. But he needed, like, a signature matchup to kind of take him to the next level and to show that he could be a star on the level of previous stars of the WWF, like Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan. And I feel like that all started for him here. Like, I don't think he gets the deal from WCW two years later without the ladder match. And the, the whole legacy of Mr. WrestleMania all starts here at WrestleMania 10 for Shawn Michaels. The next chapter, The Click. Kevin Nash is warned by Sean, just so you know, everyone hates us. Bruce said, it's not a team sport. You got to look out for yourself to make it to the top. Vince McMahon praises Sean for being smart and creative when he's sober and protected in the WWE environment, not when he's on pills and drinking and outside of the WWE environment. And this leads to the story of the Syracuse incident when Shawn Michaels was beaten up by nine thugs. Oh, excuse me. Six Marines, as Hunter said it. The newspaper said uh, nine, nine. Nine cheerleaders, as uh, Bret Hart would say. Yeah. <laughs> Never forget. 
Uh, Hunter said this kind of situation was four days out of the week with Sean. They, they touched briefly on Hunter talking about how Sean took pills for pain. He would chastise, it, chastise him for it. Uh, Vince says Sean owes his life to Hunter. They kind of just threw that line in there and moved on. I wanted Vince to elaborate on that. But they do come back to this later on. It's a yeah. weird how they jump back and forth. Yeah, this would be something that uh, it, Russell, it, it, would, it wouldn't just be Vince that, that said this throughout this whole episode. Like even Sean's wife kind of said that, that shoot Triple H was his wife before him. So that, that kind of says it all about the relationship that a Hunter and Sean had. And it's funny because the click was already established before Hunter even comes into the WWF in 1995. It was Razor and Sean and their bond of loving to work together. And then Diesel coming in as Sean's bodyguard, coming a crowd of the group. Then you had one, two, three kid kind of being the little brother of the group. And then Triple H comes in as more or less an outsider. And but he hears from everybody that these are the guys that you want to run with. These are the guys that you want to be in a group with. And they kind of took them, took him under their wing. And the rest was really history. But for, to go from that, where Triple H is like the newest member of the clique to a guy that kind of has to be the 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 brother or the conscience of the leader. Shawn Michaels of the group, it kind of shows you the evolution of of Triple H before he starts evolving in the ring. And as a character, he's evolving as a man where he's his mentality is totally different from the rest of the guys in the clique. It, seemed, it always seemed like that. He was kind of the designated driver. He wasn't doing all the hardcore drugs. He can stand up with them as far as the partying and beers, but he didn't do all the extra curricular activities that more or less Shawn and Scott did. They touched briefly on the WrestleMania 12 Iron Man match with Bret Hart, which you can watch with us right here on the True Hill Heat YouTube channel. True Rewind 44, True Rewind 45. Uh, Bret talking about this match, almost complaining about how stiff Sean was. <laughs> That's the impression I got from Brett talking about this match. No, he, he did admit that they stiffed each other. We got in the live chat right now, Rachel Cornell saying hello. We also got the Wrestling Lowdown Show. Please let us know in the live chat what you thought about uh, the the Shawn Michaels A&E biography. Send in those super chats a dollar or more. We will feature you on this episode. I wanted to shout out those watching with us in the live chat right now. But yes, uh, yeah, I mean, Brett, Brett was honest, though. He said that he stiffed him as well, and I, I, it added to the match. That was one of the best parts of the match, that it was hard-hitting. Uh, we, we did talk about it in depth on our True, True Rewind episodes that it was a long match, a very, very long match, and not a lot of action in, like, the first, I want to say, what, 30, 40 minutes of the match, Romeo? <laughs> Yeah, watch with us. <laughs> Shawn Michaels talks about the pressure of being world champion. The whole locker room relies on you. The whole thing was uncomfortable, he says. But I didn't get that. This is what he wanted. He wanted to be on top. And it sounded like he just wasn't ready for it. It, it was a strange time where he kind of... He's coming into his own and he's really developing into one of the top stars of the company at a time when the company is at one of its lowest. Like you're just coming off the long title run of Diesel, which even to this day is one of the least drawing, least profitable WWF championship reigns of all time. While on the other hand, on the other show, WCW Nitro is finally picking up steam. It's finally coming together. It feels more vibrant. It feels more exciting. They have all the stars from the past, like Macho Man, Hulk Hogan. They have stars of the future, like Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Chris Jericho coming in. And then by the summer, we got the whole NWO angle, which it's like it's like they're they're in a foot race where they're like side by side WWF WCW and then WCW just speeds ahead as soon as they sign Sean's two best friends like I under like I this was one point that I feel like was missing is Sean's mentality as far as how he felt with Scott and and uh, Kevin leaving like I feel like they touched on it but they could have gone a little bit more especially having Kevin Nash and Scott Hall here where I feel like they didn't really contribute that much to the biography they kind of were just yeah. 
sprinkled in in different parts. And in this part where Sean is feeling like the weight of the world on him, I feel like that would have been the best time to kind of hear their reactions or hear Sean's reactions to them leaving at that time. Yeah, good points. Uh, they go into the current call, May 19, 1996. They interview the Mark, who screams like a girl and recorded all this uh, when the heels all did the current call. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Yes! Uh, Vince says he remembers watching and going, what the hell? Uh, Ric Flair says if they did it in the 1970s or the 80s, all of them would have got the shit beat out of them. And speaking of shit, Hunter tells us that shit rolls downhill. And Sean says he didn't feel compassion at the time for Hunter's burial like he should have. Sheesh, that was a rough line. And, you know, remember how monumental this moment is in leading to Hunter's burial and coincidentally, Steve Austin's ascension. Absolutely. Like, she, like yeah, I think that this was a very eye-opening uh, part of this A&E biography in Sean admitting that he wasn't as compassionate as he should have been for his best friend, the only friend that he has left. Like, you're so heartbroken that the two guys that have made a name for themselves already in the WWF are leaving, but you don't really appreciate the guy that's still there with you and the struggle that he has to go through for the decision that you made. At the end of the day, Sean, it's all on you. Because if you said, no, we're not going to do this, it would have never happened. But you made the decision as the WWF champion, as the biggest star in this click group, to do this and to have their moment at Madison Square Garden. And you just didn't really care for the repercussions that your best friend was going to have after it. It's really an eye-opening uh, type of situation uh, in, in, this, in this part of the A&E uh, biography. Speaking of which, we got the Wrestling Lowdown Show says, I've seen, I, I, have, I haven't, I guess he's saying, I haven't seen any of the A&E documentary yet. I'm hesitant because it's done with WWE. Yes. Yes, uh, I, that is a that is a good point to make, and I understand why most people are hesitate to watch these, and that's why we review it for you, so you don't have to watch. Romeo does a great job of breaking down each part of it, so you don't have to watch, and we'll tell you what was good and what was bad about it. Uh, we got also Rachel Cornell in the live chat saying Bret Hart and CM Punk are probably the only two honest wrestling personalities, to be fair. They both seem like they have are at peace to never want to be in any organization and there is nothing held back. I agree and disagree with your with your comment here, Rachel. Uh, I feel like, yes, Bret Hart is very honest, but to say that Bret Hart is at peace, it ignores the fact that Bret Hart is a very bitter man and he <laughs> does let his bitterness show quite, quite some often, quite often, especially when it comes to Triple H or Bill Goldberg. Uh, we got the MWN Network. What's going on? I haven't seen you in a live chat in a while. Thanks for joining us for the A&E Biography Shawn Michaels Review. They said, did you guys take in how they made Booker and RVD look like failures looking to rise from the ashes because of their uh, weed charges while Shawn Shawn Michaels on coke and party life was his come up. <laughs> that is a good point Fair because, point. I, like, I, like I said, I watched the RVD, uh, the RVD icon special before I watched this A and E biography, and it is very funny that you know they viewed RVD as too laid back and lacking passion because he's a stoner, he's a chill guy. But I like the fact that they had Brian Gerwitz kind of mention that he was relatable because of those things. And that's why the fans were so behind him. And then on the other hand, you know, Shawn Michaels on Coke, he's going to look more passionate because he's got more energy. He's on, he's on the Coke life. He's on the party life. So he looks like he has more passion. He looks like he's more excited to be there. I guess that's like the difference in the two. Uh, he also says they make light of Shawn, of Shawn, of Michael's uh, drug use while Booker and RVD kind of got shamed low key, uh, then praise crazy how the narratives can be painted. Um, I, I don't really remember Booker T's uh, marijuana use too much. I think Booker T was more ha uh, held back in shame because of, um, Oh, what's that? Oh, the color of the skin. Yeah, oh. the color of the skin. Yeah, it seemed like seemed like the thing, and they kind of ignored the part where they made that a freaking storyline going into WrestleMania. That was the biggest narrative hole of any of probably any of the A and E biographies so far, in my opinion. 
Um, we, and then I'll read one more comment we got here. <laughs> Rachel answering me back. She says, leave my bread alone. I love him. Oh. I'm, not, I'm not surprised he is bitter with everything that's happened to him and his family. It's nothing more than I'd expect, but he is truthful, I feel. I do agree with you 100%. Bret Hart is truthful. Bret Hart tells it like he sees it. So I'll leave your Bret Hart alone. I'm a huge Bret Hart fan myself, but we are we are talking about the time where I kind of chose Sean over Brett. So let's get into that more, uh, Romeo. It's only fitting that we'd get a little Brett Hart versus Shawn Michaels here in the chat uh, <laughs> for this biography review. I mean, geez, so fitting. Uh, Hunter talks about Shawn uh, collapsing under the pressure of being world champion, literally collapsing in the hotel room, pilled up, passed out. Hunter having to put him on a luggage cart to take him to his room, get him undressed, take the dip out of his mouth put him on his side, put a pillow behind him so he wouldn't roll over and choke to death in his sleep, setting an alarm to get up every two to three hours to check on him, and that was every night a sad existence. This was dark, and Hunter saved Shawn Michaels before any god or any pastor did uh, later on in this episode and later on in, uh, in Shawn's life. He was the babysitter. He was the, the wife before the wife of Shawn Michaels. Like, if it wasn't for Hunter, I, I agree with Vince that Sean probably wouldn't be with us today. And that's sad to say, but it is it does a credit to their friendship and their brotherhood that they had together. We got a couple of we got a couple of people watching us on Facebook, a couple of people watching us on YouTube right now. Thank you so much for joining us for our AE biography, Sean Michaels review. If you are new to the True Hill Heat YouTube channel, smash that subscribe button, hit the bell to stay notified. We always get these live streams every Monday. Monday for the A&E biography. So we'll be back next week as well, but smash that subscribe button. We're closing in on 1.3 thousand subscribers. We are like 20 something away. So share this video on all the favorite social media platforms and keep on coming in with the live chats. We're getting a lot of live chats uh, in on YouTube, but if you're watching us on Facebook or Twitter, leave your thoughts. If you haven't watched the A&E biography, just leave us your thoughts on Whatever part of Shawn Michaels' career you are most passionate about, let us know how you felt about it. Romeo, keep it coming. Vince refers to Shawn's dad as the colonel, and he visits him in person to tell him of his son's drug problem. His dad didn't want to hear it. Fascinating. I never knew this story. Wow. that's yeah, I, I never heard this part of the story. Uh, it's That was kind of like shocking to me that he really wouldn't listen. And uh, he's living up to his name, Dick Hickenbottom. Oh. <laughs> uh, moving on, the, the there's a doctor in San Antonio who tells Sean that he's done because he's got a torn ACL, can never wrestle again. And that's when Sean Michaels loses his smile. Brett says uh, he didn't want to lose to him, Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13. Sean talks about getting a knee brace and uh, finding out he can wrestle. Returns in, coincidentally, May 1997 after WrestleMania. What are the odds? What, what are, are the, the odds? odds? What yeah, are the Shawn odds? Shawn Michaels' bullshit here was rough. <laughs> <laughs> like he still stands by the bullshit that he did almost 25 years ago. Like he still stands by it. It's it's insane to me that that Sean even you know born again you know a new Sean Michaels he still stands by that he had a knee even injury. after he and Brett have buried the hatchet still. you still can't be honest you still can't I think the only time that they didn't like touch on it or they he did he was probably honest about it was maybe the Brett and Sean uh, rival special where they were both where they both sat down and talked about their rivalry. Maybe that's the only time that he probably admitted that he didn't want a job. And that's to... so good, by the way, if you haven't seen it. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. I hope that is up on the uh, Peacock Network. We got Frantic World in the live chat now. We got Rambo, Rambo77619 joining us right now. Drop us a like on this video. You guys watching us on YouTube, share this video with all your wrestling fans, friends, and family. You're watching us on Facebook or Twitter. About 10 or so people watching us on Facebook, 10 or so watching us on Twitter. Drop us a like. Let us know uh, in the live chat how you guys are feeling. If you're watching us on YouTube, send in those super chats. We always are looking for a little bit of contribution. If you want to help us out a dollar or more, 
it, it definitely will help out the channel, helps us grow. We are now monetized right here on True Hill Heat. Very happy about that. So send in those super chats and we will highlight your comment. Uh, one highlight of the comment I want to give here is we got Rachel who's been who's been live in the live chat. Thank you, Rachel. You are bringing us a lot, a lot of material here with your, your pro Bret Hart stance. I love it. I love it so much. I can't stand HBK. I do feel like he hides behind this finding God narrative. It seems to it seems too perfect. I think if there is anyone deeply bitter, it's him. He was an asshole. I was there in Birmingham, UK. Oh, they, yeah, that's another one they didn't mention was the um the one night only where he he basically politicked to beat British Bulldog on the night that he dedicated the European Championship match to his sister that had cancer. That is one of the biggest political jobs of Shawn Michaels' career, but this is another another reason why, you know, M MWN talked about earlier that the WWE produced documentaries kind of skim over stuff that makes people look too bad. That's some that's a that's a part that would have made Michaels look too bad and something that's supposed to uplift Shawn Michaels. Uh we also got uh, Oh, but w if it was Macho Man. He's not here to defend himself, so we we're gonna talk about it. Of course. If it was Macho Man, they would have just <laughs> they would have dragged that shit out. Oh <clears throat> We got MW Network saying 100% agree Booker being the Milano uh, king that he is uh, affected his role. These documentaries have been dope, brilliant way for this generation of legends uh, to tell their story as the prior generation sadly limits. It's a true, true story. And thank you for joining us. You guys are bringing a lot in the live chat right now. And Rachel talking about that, that, that infamous <laughs> job that they didn't talk about at all in this documentary. Uh, Rachel says when and he screwed Davy Boy Smith and his poor sister at the time to just get in his own way. He he has never come out and stated or owned up to anything he did. I think he's an amazing performer, but not a nice person. I think, Rachel, you would get along very well with my wife. My wife is a very passionate pro Bret Hart fan. And she also thinks that the whole coming to Jesus, Shawn Michaels, is a load of crap. And to be fair, Ooh. my wife does have personal connections to the WWE and does know the Shawn Michaels that we don't see on camera. So to be fair, she, she has a little bit more knowledge than that we all have. So I understand your point of view, Rachel, because I hear it all the time from my wife. <laughs> Man, I need a shower. This is getting uh, very, very dirty. <laughs> and then, Shawn and then, Michaels and then is my top, favorite. To top off Rachel's comments, we got true draw Josh draw. Josh say Sean Michaels like is trash. I feel like I'm getting uh beaten up by nine thugs in the true heel heat uh <laughs> That's what it feels like. You feel like you're in Syracuse. <laughs> yeah. This is a Syracuse beatdown in the True Heel Heat uh chat. Oh my goodness. Oh man. Go going forward with this biography, uh DX is born out of necessity. The business was changing. Undertaker talks about, about Shawn Michaels' personality not turning off because his DX personality morphs into his real one. And things between Sean and Brett get personal. <laughs> Go figure, it's getting personal in this chat. Uh it leads to fist cuffs in the locker room. Sean says that he and Brett would settle things out but very quickly offend each other again. <laughs> that was funny. He laughed about it too. Yeah, I mean, they were both throwing in uh, shots. I think Bright Hart was brilliant in this uh, this A and E biography. I felt like his contributions, especially talking about him and Sean's feud, I think that he was uh, very fair in his analysis and knew that it was not a one sided thing. Like probably Bret Hart of maybe 15, 20 years ago would have said that it was all Sean. <laughs> and I want to highlight this comment because uh, I agree with this uh, Rambo saying I'm fascinated to see how they deal with Brett seeing as uh, Brett is the way he is I bet he owns up to more than HBK Bret Hart's biography is coming up that's going to be a good one that's going to be a good one and that's why I was okay yeah, with might. them I was okay with them kind of scanning over the Montreal screw job because I understood we still have Bret Hart's documentary uh, to go <laughs> uh, speaking of the Montreal screw job Triple H says Vince told him this goes to the grave Sean says the whole thing uncomfortable for him. Taker calls it one of the most fabled stories of our industry. Vince says he didn't want anyone to know Sean was on, in on it. Brett, Brett, obviously, about his one punch to Vince. He can't, he can't not tell that story every single time. Uh, talks about Sean crying. 
Sean talks about the burden of knowing and not being able to say anything to Brett. Uh, this is going to get the chat riled up. I know it. <laughs> yo, yo, your bread, your bread talking about this whole shit. Like, I love when bread talks about the screw job. I love what he, I don't love when he talks about like the screw job per se. I love when he talks about the post screw job, everything that happens after it. Talking about, you know, punching, punching Vince. And we're going to probably get more details into that whole confrontation that happened in the locker room. But yeah, Sean, Sean, yeah, he was just full of shit. And you know we we hear the footage of Sean. I swear, I swear on my kids, I swear on my kids, I swear on my father, that I had nothing to do with it. You goddamn liar! You got you get paid to lie and be a character for a living. I get that, but Jesus Christ, Sean! What like, an acting job! What an acting job, indeed. And then he cries. He cries after Brett punches. Me. Oh God! He's like he's like the burden, the so burden. I what I know. <laughs> the burden of what I know. Oh my God. I, I, the tears, tears. The next, next chapter, goodbye for now. The casket match versus The Undertaker where Sean gets hurt, bumping on the edge of the coffin. Talks about the next day, waking up, not being able to move. The doctor once again says, hey, you can't wrestle anymore. You got a, you got a, a hurt back. Uh, he had to get a surgery and everything. She gets to with Austin, very heavily medicated. Hunter said, he was bitter, not being the man anymore, and says one of probably the the thing that annoyed Hunter the most. Uh, I should have taken so many pills after WrestleMania 10. I should have died. I would have been Elvis. And Sean admits he's not just a drug addict; he's an angry one. That line he told Hunter. Wow. Never heard that one before, and we wouldn't hear that on like a WWE, strictly WWE produced documentary. So I'm glad that we got this Shawn Michaels A and E biography because that's the first time I ever heard that that Shawn was like had suicidal thoughts like that. And yes, he does seem like a very angry, um, angry addict. What, what would you think? What would be Shawn Michaels' legacy if he did die after WrestleMania 10? Oh my goodness, you, I. Can't even we, imagine. We would have never got the Iron Man match. We would have never got the WWF title run in 1996. We would have never got, you know, uh, D Generation X. It's crazy. It's crazy to think wow. about how, how much things would just be poof, gone, and never to happen if he would have committed suicide after WrestleMania 10. He would have went out with like his first his first great performance. Not not his greatest. That's not even his greatest performance, in my opinion. I feel like the performances 2002 and on are are greater in my memory than WrestleMania 10 at this point because of how much he had to overcome and come back from. But to know that his first great performance after that, he had he contemplating just taking his life. Imagine how much of wrestling history would not be with us. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of others gone way too fast. You know, uh, Brian Pillman. What, what, what did we miss out? Brian Pillman going away. True. What did we miss out? Uh, Eddie Guerrero going away. Like it's, Owen it's Hart. Sad. If you think about it. Yeah, Owen Hart. Exactly. Oh, who knows what kind of memories we'd have missed out on? Uh, going forward, WrestleMania 14. Triple H was the conduit between Steve Austin and HBK. They didn't talk. Triple H helped put the match together. Going room. To room. That's how uh, bad it was for Shawn Michaels at this time. Shawn says he's uh, him putting over Austin. He thought that was good enough. Uh, Tyson putting the Austin shirt over Shawn's chest at the end there was adding insult to injury, Steve thought. And Steve says he would have been pissed off too. Shawn says they got the last laugh, even though it wasn't on the level of a Montreal screw job. Austin says Shawn was selfish and stupid, but that's where he was at the time. Yeah, he was at his wit's end. Like, we, we see what happened with his uh, back injury. And just, you know, to go through, what, three months after that, where you know you just have to get to this one big show and then that's it for you, you're kind of just like, fuck it. Fuck it. Like, he already had that fuck it type of mentality contemplating suicide years earlier. And then in the year, in the, in the couple of months building up to WrestleMania, even before the back injury, it's it's sad. It's kind of it's kind of sad to see where his state of mind was at at this time. The next chapter, a new life. He jokes about uh, going to rehab. Oh, uh, excuse me, physical therapy. 
Pause one second, but we got excuse. Go ahead. We got we got a promoter of the year, Tony Khan, in the in the live chat oh, wow. with us. Thank, hey, Tony. Hey, Tony Khan thanks for definitely joining. hit us up with our super chat. Yeah, Tony, Tony, Big Buck Tony, come on, give us a dollar, give us a dollar, uh, Big Buck Tony, you're a billionaire, for God's sake, <laughs> but yes, greetings, welcome to our A&E biography, Shawn Michaels uh, review, drop us a subscribe and drop us a dollar, Tony, you're a billionaire, for God's sake, uh, we also got a highlight, we got, um, we got Rachel quoting Quoting the uh, the comments in in after the Montreal screw job, she says, "We have seen the tape, Sean. You, you weren't in on on that on that." And HBK says, "I swear to God, my hands are clean on this one." <laughs> and then we also got Damn. Rambo saying, "Do you remember in around 2004? I think Jericho had HBK on his Jera show. I think he's talking about um, what was the highlight reel." in Montreal when yeah. he wasn't the clean Sean and he wound uh, fans up that night. I think he was the clean Sean. He was definitely the clean Sean in 2004. Any, any Sean post-2002 was the clean Sean, but I do remember that Sean would always round, wound up the fans whenever he, he made his presence known in uh, Montreal. And then finally, we got Brett Thomas, the, the campaign manager of the Paul Brother campaign, saying, a high SP3, it was a shame the WWE didn't have one of the talking heads be Logan Paul. He was an HBK fan. To be fair, um, I'm good. Thomas, I, I no, I prefer Logan Paul over Peter Rosenberg. Just me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, you know, oh, oh, oh. Peter is a fellow New Yorker. I, I love what he does on the radio. It's just his oh, when he's ever a part of the WWE um, business, it seems like he's like a a like it's one of those Urkel dolls who says like the catchphrases. You just pull the string. It's I ah. did I do that? It's like whatever WWE wants him to say, they just pull the string and Peter Rosenberg says it. Um, Shawn Michaels gets his own wrestling school, which was which he said was fun for him. Do you know anyone uh, anybody good ever graduate from there? Um, there was this kid named Spanky and um Paul. Oof. Paul something from England, uh, Paul London, and there was also this one guy, this one guy. You ever heard of a Brian Danielson? Oh, is, is that the guy that uh, uh, just got retired by the end of the table? <laughs> You're right. You're right. Former former WWE former WWE champion Danny O'Brien is one of the graduates of the Shawn Michaels Academy. Sean Michaels watching uh, Nitro falls in love with a Nitro girl. Her name is Rebecca. Wait, they get married very quickly. Kids, don't do this. Don't get married after four, four weeks. This is a very nice story that they are still together and still happy. But this is not how you handle meeting the love of your life, getting married after four weeks. Uh, yeah, she took care of him while he was on pills. I bet that was quite the shock for her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she she definitely they definitely rushed into to things. I think I think this was at the point that my wife walked in the room as I'm watching this biography, and she's like, "Wait, they got married after like a week? Like what? <laughs> they just they just said that they love each other, and then that was it. They just went and got married. I think Rebecca didn't know what she was signing up for. Sean's backstage hanging out at Raw. He's pilled up told by Vince to go home, takes it out on Hunter backstage, goes home. This was probably the most emotional Shawn Michaels got in this uh, biography when he talks about how he and Hunter didn't talk for a year to two years. Shawn called it rock bottom. Your, your best friend, you've let him down so much that it kind of just tears your two guys apart. Like he, he was the, the stable one for Sean. Like he was the person that kind of propped up Sean for a long time and to lose him in that friendship. That's when you kind of realize you hit rock bottom. Like a lot of people say it all the time when you're in a really bad place, it's when your friends and like your family kind of just distance themselves from you. That's when it really opens your eyes to where you've, you've uh, brought yourself to. He lets go of drugs and alcohol after a coming to Jesus moment where his son was laying on him, knocked out. And his son says, Daddy's sleeping. And there's there's this pastor with Sean. Sean asks him to pray for his back. 
He was so desperate to get back in a close relationship with his wife and son. And Sean eventually becomes calmer, easier to deal with. And it's a miracle, an absolute miracle that his back pain is gone, says his wife. We got uh, in the... So the comeback in, is on. Exactly. We got in the live chat a couple of more comments for us to, to read. Oh, Rachel, this is a nice one. She says, I had such a stressful day, but to come home and watch this show, then I got powered for big fight weekly and added time after my evening is filled with entertainment. For sure, that's what we're here for. We're here for your entertainment. We'll probably have another video later on today right here on the True Hill Heat YouTube channel. Uh, tomorrow is my birthday, so you, I don't know if we'll have an upload tomorrow, but of course we'll have another upload on Wednesday. And this week, Romeo has a brand new uh, review show that he's starting up. You want to tell the tell uh, Rachel and everyone else watching? Me and Drunk Guy, JJ, will be reviewing Monday Night Raw. We are the Rated Raw Superstar! How did I do that? How did I do that? I, I love because because your phone or Wi-Fi broke you up, so you, you really held on to the Sue! <laughs> you paused on the Sue! For stars! Awesome. Awesome. That, that was perfect. That worked out perfect for you. We got the wrestling lowdown says Sean said he was a shy guy and had to ask someone else to get her number for him. Yes, great Great stuff, Shawn Michaels being a shy guy. Imagine that the 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 heartbreak kid, mm -hmm. and then uh, Rachel, two cool comments. She says, "Is your wife a wrestler? She has trained to be a wrestler." And a little known fact that I'll drop on here: she'll probably get mad at me after I'm done here, but she is the niece of the Gorilla Monsoon. If you if you watch uh, True Rewind with myself, Romeo, and Drunk Guy JJ, we mention that all the time, and we call Gorilla Uncle Gino. That's because my wife is uh, the niece of Gorilla Monsoon. And uh, she also says, happy birthday, SP3. Happy birthday. Hope you have a wonderful day. What will you be doing? What will I be doing on my birthday? I can announce here, I'll be on Wrestling Daily. I'll be a special appearance on a Tuesday. I'll also be on, on Wednesday with Alex McCarthy. But tomorrow on Wrestling Daily, I will be live uh, 8 p.m. BST, 3 p.m. Eastern Time with Stephanie Chase on Wrestling Daily. We're going to be talking about Monday Night Raw, all the latest wrestling news, and you guys can join us live and wish me a happy birthday. It's going to be a SP3 birthday celebration over on Wrestling Daily. Uh, and then we got MW Network saying, surprise, Michael Shane didn't get to chat in the bio unless I missed his cameo. Michael Shane, original X Division champs uh, that carried TNA and Impact uh, in the early days. And he says, Michael Shane is Shawn Michaels' cousin. Yes, I remember that story that uh, Michael Shane, he was one of the like the early pioneers. He was in the original Ultimate X match in TNA <laughs> against, uh, I believe it was Chris Sabin and... I want to say Kazarian or Petey Williams, but yeah, the guy was very talented, not as talented as the rest of the graduates of the uh, Shawn Michaels Academy that we mentioned earlier, Spanky, Paul London, Danny O'Brien, but he's definitely in that conversation as well. Also, uh, Lance Cade is another uh, graduate of the Shawn Michaels Academy that we didn't mention. So Shawn Michaels only trust one man uh, for his comeback, and he asked him if he can do it. It's Triple H, SummerSlam 2002, and what a comeback it was. By far, I, I, if, you, if you follow my work on Sports Keto Wrestling, I dropped the article last summer. The number one greatest SummerSlam matchup of all time, in my opinion, is Shawn Michaels' return at SummerSlam 2002 against Triple H. I just feel like build up to the matchup to the aftermath and what it meant what what it would what it would basically proceed is like this comeback that Shawn Michaels had over 8 years that I feel that is better than his original career in 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 the WWE Shawn Michaels is the the best comparison to Kobe Bryant of anyone in in professional wrestling he had two different careers he had his number 8 Jersey career, which was which would span from the Rockers to the Heartbreak Kid, and then the back injury at WrestleMania 14, and then he had his number 24 jersey from 2002 to 2010. And I just feel like the 24 jersey for Shawn Michaels was better than the number eight. 
you know, I could also make that same comparison with Michael Jordan when, when he uh, went off into baseball and then came back. It's true. Uh, He's with Ric Flair. Shorter. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. True. Ric Flair calls Sean the greatest in-ring performer of all time. This leads to them talking about the Ric Flair WrestleMania 24, one of my personal favorite storylines slash matches of all time. Sean says it was his love letter to the wrestling business and to Ric Flair. Yeah, um, this was another instance in these A and E biographies where they skip over a whole lot of shit. Like, <laughs> like I understand you only got limited amount of time, but I would have liked the mention of the Kurt Angle match at WrestleMania 21. This would have been a great, a great spot to just have a little cameo from from Kurt Angle to talk about. Like, I think that in I think in my opinion, that's probably Kurt Angle's best WWE match. And it's really, it's really a match that elevated the 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 status of uh, Shawn Michaels as Mr. WrestleMania. I understand not touching on his first WrestleMania back against Chris Jericho because you can't get Chris Jericho. I mean, you got him for the Broken Skull session, but I guess you couldn't get him for the A and E biography. So I understand skimming over that, and I understand skimming over the Chris Benoit Triple H match as well. I understand, but the Kurt <laughs> Angle one, I just felt like they could have touched on that. Um, 2002 interview, he says he's least proud of the Montreal screw job. Bret Hart talks about, uh, he would have killed him if he saw him <laughs> and negative thoughts like that, uh, Brett could see probably, uh, having led to his stroke and they go over the 2010 truce between them on Monday night raw, which I still think is, uh, what a moment. Uh, it's still surreal to watch over. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was. My wife was also in the room for that part, and I was like, I remember that like it was yesterday. It was like eleven years ago. It was on my mom's birthday, but that's one of the biggest nights in Raw history of the past like decade and a half. Like you have because they're going up. It's not you have to understand the context around everything. Like this is not just a, a random Monday Night Raw at the beginning of the year. It's the first Raw of two thousand ten. And they're going up against TNA Impact. The first time they are running, they are running opposed by another wrestling show since the the clo the closing and the departure of WCW. So this was a huge night. They needed a big hook to hook the fans in. This was coming off of a 2009 that wasn't exactly the best for WWE. If we are being honest with each other, 2009, 2000, like yeah. 2009 through 2011 weren't the best years for WWE in general, but 2009, the latter half was just really bad. So WWE really needed a hook for this first this first Raw because I was a TNA fan and I was very interested to see what they would do going up against Monday Night Raw. But as soon as they announced, I think it was like two weeks before or a week before, that Bret the Hitman Hart will be on Monday Night Raw for the first time since Montreal. You, you had me. You had me because I was going to watch Monday Night Raw to start things off before TNA because I wanted to see what they were going to do with Bret Hart. Were they going to have Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels in the ring together? Were they going to have Bret Hart and Vince McMahon together? And they booked that show perfectly because they started off the night with the Bret Hart and uh, Shawn Michaels confrontation with them shaking hands. And then they ended the night with the Bret Hart and Vince McMahon confrontation. Just brilliant booking by WWE to do it that way because you gave Gave us a hook at the beginning of the show and a hook for the end of the show to stay with it. The next two matches, you know, they had to talk about WrestleMania 25, WrestleMania 26, The Undertaker. Uh, Taker talking about 25, loving the entrances, the stark contrast with Sean in an all white, lowering from the heavens. So, Michael's heavens, oh my god. Uh, years since they worked together, but Taker liked them now. Uh, they hadn't uh, wrestled since he injured himself in that casket match. And then WrestleMania 26, uh, Adam Cole, baby, had the same knot in his stomach watching that match that I did. I had the same knot. Uh, Taker wins, retires Shawn Michaels, re retires Shawn Michaels. And <laughs> Taker uh, mentions how he was sure to get out early at the end there so the fans can appreciate and give Shawn Michaels his moment. All the hugs and tears backstage, Vince McMahon, Bret Hart, Undertaker, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, anything on anything on WrestleMania 25, WrestleMania 26. I mean, WrestleMania 25, 
the it's it I I always say the conversation for the GOAT WrestleMania match starts and ends with Bret Hart versus Stone Cold at WrestleMania 13 and Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 25. If those aren't your like if you do a tournament of the greatest WrestleMania matches of all time and those are not in the finals, then you did it wrong. You did it wrong because those are <laughs> one A, one B. Those are one and two. Regardless how you see it, those are the pantheon of the greatest WrestleMania matches of all time because of what happened during the matchup and the impact that it had after it. Like Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker was so good at WrestleMania 25 that Michaels felt so compelled that he can never top that that he decided to retire. <laughs> like, like that's how epic that's how amazing that matchup at wrestlemania 25 i remember it like it was yesterday i was at my friend's house shots out to steve stash i was at his uh his cousin's house in harlem i brought my nephew my nephew at the time i have to think i have to think how old my nephew is now and how old he was back then i think he was about maybe uh eight eight nine years old at the time my, my youngest nephew Todd. shouts out to him as well but he was watching and he was bored with the show he was honestly bored with the show. And then immediately Shawn Michaels comes up from, from the heavens and uh, comes down with the whole white outfit. And he immediately like pops up. He wakes up. And like as the match started, he just gets more and more energy. Like seeing it through a kid's eyes was honestly, those are some of my favorite years of watching wrestling is watching it through his eyes. That's why I can't wait for my kids to get old enough to watch wrestling because watching it through my nephew's eyes was such a fun time and how he loved Shawn Michaels. Like my nephew, every time Shawn Michaels would do his entrance, my nephew would get on his knees and do the <laughs> the, 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 the pyro he'd be like oh pyro and then he'd do the pose and everything my nephew loved Shawn michaels at that time and he was so enamored by that matchup and he was so into it he got so into it he was so heartbroken with sean lost at the end and then he was even more heartbroken the following year i brought him to uh my my friend steve stash cousin's house again and he was so heartbroken when sean lost there but he clapped for him at the end of the night and you know it was it was. I felt like he the cried, person didn't that he? he cried, didn't he? I, I, I might have cried. I might have cried because I felt the person that I related to the most on this biography was Adam Cole, talking about the feeling going into that weekend because you know it's going to be a great matchup. Shawn Michaels and Bre and uh, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker going at it once again this time in the main event. But you know it's going to be the end because the streak is not going to end by Shawn Michaels. You know it's the end. To, so to see it, watch it unfold, great, incredible matchup in the main event of WrestleMania 26. But it was heartbreaking to see my, one of my favorites of all time, top two, top three of all time, Shawn Michaels, end his career off. But what a way to go out. They end this biography, uh, going in a little bit more into how Sean is a Hunter's right-hand man right now in NXT, his connection still to the business, and Sean says the same business that almost killed him saved him. And the end here is Johnny Gargano singing and dancing to Sean's theme song, uh, weird, goofy fucking ending, but um, I, I think you could end this with something a little less goofy than this. You, I would have had it with the WrestleMania 26 retirement stuff, but uh, Johnny Gargano had to dance. <laughs> Do the Sean. <laughs> oh man, Johnny Gargano was fun. He was he was at least fun here. Um, yeah, man, this was this was a a a, a good a good uh, episode of biography. Um, I don't know. I I think that is this series is still trying to meet the 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 peak that we got with the stone cold one i still feel like the stone cold one was the best of the bunch so far but this wasn't that far behind this was a really well told story i like that they they kind of told the story in chapters because Shawn michaels career is so vast and so long and there's so much for you to get into and deep dive into i feel like they did a good job of talking about his personal issues and the drug use 
Um, I don't feel like they glorified it. They kind of told his whole story of how his partying was kind of viewed as like a fun thing in his younger ages. But as he got as he got older and the pressures of the business got to him, it became too much and it became an addiction that he had to overcome. And I like the, you know, the talking about him becoming born again, going to church and becoming a better man for his family. And then the second run, I feel like the second run, though, that's where this one, this one had the holes in it. And they could have talked about a little other stuff. Like I said, the, the Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle match at WrestleMania 21, I would have loved for them to get into the, the reuniting of DX. I would have loved for them to get into that, even though, you know, you, you, they could have just talked about how Sean was different from his original run in DX and they had to do things different this time around. And what was Sean's kind of reaction to doing things a little bit different with this run of DX. So I would have liked those little tidbits. Uh, I felt like they could have gone a little bit more into the Ric Flair WrestleMania 24 as well. I feel like they kind of brushed over that and just had really Peter, Peter Rosenberg put the most input on that and that when you had Ric Flair there, you had Shawn Michaels there. I would have loved to hear more from them about what that match meant to them. And, you know, you don't have Chris Jericho, but the Chris Jericho Shawn Michaels feud is like the most important thing about that second run. Without that feud, I don't think I would say the second run is better than the first. But because of that feud, I 100% agree because Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho is one of the best rivalries in WWE history. So I understand you don't have Chris there, but you just asked him to do Broken Skulls. Why not give him another paycheck and have him contribute to this? I would have liked to hear his contributions to this or A&E reach out to him and really tell us a full Shawn Michaels story. I understand you only got an hour and a half or two hours altogether with commercials, but I just would have liked a little bit more of the second run, which I feel is better, but you didn't really get that across in this biography. How about you, Romeo? What was your thoughts overall? Uh I will say that um, yes, there's more more of uh, his career that could have touched. It's such a legendary career. It's so many moments, so much to talk about. But I do think that they talked a lot more wrestling stuff in this biography than they did in any of the previous biographies, where we had true. the same complaints. That this one, they they talked about way more, and there was a lot of moments to revisit. That's uh, it's it's hard to fit in what you said an hour and a half or whatever. Yeah, it's just it just it's like it's. It's cool how they're telling these stories and they are focusing on the outside of the ring characters and issues that they had and, you know, telling their, their full story from before their careers as well, which is cool. I feel like the best one that did that, like kind of the before wrestling story, I feel like the best one was last week with the Booker T um this one was really good with telling the details of how sean got into wrestling and stuff but like you said sean had such a long career so you can understand why some things were left on the cutting room floor uh, a couple of comments that we got to read here i'm getting some birthday wishes brett thomas wishing me a happy birthday oh yeah Thank you, sir. i appreciate that and we even getting uncle gino shots out brett thomas says i've heard gorilla monsoon was one of the nicest human beings like just a gentle guy he and jesse were my favorite commentary team they smash anything they have today especially that pratt <laughs> Saxton. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Rachel showing some love to my wife. That's cool about your wife. She sounds amazing. You should get her on True Hill Heat. I think everybody. Yes, we should. Sure. I think everybody in their mama. I'm going to call her that. Miss P3. I I'm going to tell her. I'm going to tell her you said that. And she'll probably DM you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss, Miss P3 is, 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 is shy. She's, she's a little shy. She doesn't like to get in front of the camera, but. I have I, if you if you follow me on Twitter at True Hill SP3, I am contemplating starting a second YouTube channel for non wrestling things. And me and my wife are huge catfish fans, so maybe we'll go back, we'll get into the DeLorean, and we'll start all the way from season one of Catfish and do reviews. Let us know in the in the comments section if you're watching us on demand. If you if you would love to see a YouTube channel with reviews nice. from me and my wife of Catfish, I think that would be awesome. Uh, Rachel also says 30 for 30 on Ric Flair was brutal and really showed a more true side of Rick with his relationship with kids and how somewhat selfish he was. I would prefer the 30 30 to do these documentary. Yeah, you're probably right. I think 30 for 30 would do a little bit better at telling like the full stories than these are doing. Actually, Rachel, um, the guy who's doing these biographies does work with the 30 for 30. 
Hmm. I did not know that. See, I don't. Right. I don't I, know his name, but if you look in the info, it'll tell you that he is associated. He has done thirty for thirty work. I learned something new here. Rachel also says, "I really like you, SP3. You are so talented. Thank you so much. You, John Scott, and Stu Stu Palmer are my besties." Talking about the folks over at Powered Four TV, and she says, "Romeo, you are growing on me as oh. you are calm. He's a calm soul. You That's should see me when I'm drinking." <laughs> yes. Check out, check out. Uh, which, 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 which review was that? I think one of our roundtable oh, reviews. Was Romeo, <laughs> Romeo's totally scared. Yes, check him out when he's a little bit uh, more enamored. Um, Rachel also talking about uh, when we talked about the January fourth, two thousand ten Raw. She said, "What I would give for a Raw like that again." And I think Romeo agrees with you as he's about to take on reviewing Raw on the True. Oh, Jesus. And then she finally says, uh, disagreeing with me, she says that Brett versus Stone Cold and Owen versus Brett is the best WrestleMania matches. That's uh, right. I, Get I, those Stone Michaels matches out of there. Let's, let's talk about some Brett Hart matches. You knew that was coming. I, I, you, know, <laughs> you know, she's really hammering at home. Who's her favorite? Uh, we got the wrestling lowdown show saying uh, HBK was only one to have two matches with uh, Taker. Two matches of that quality because Kane was another one that had two matches with Taker at WrestleMania, and so was Triple H. Triple H. Yeah. Rachel, I hope you join us for the Bret Hart biography, whenever that is. I think it sounds like it'll be the last one, probably. Most, most likely. you got to spread it out. You can't have this one. You can't have the Shawn Michaels and then the Bret Hart right after it. Um, yeah, because she, next week. Look what we're getting into next week. Uh, you can tell us, because I never see the commercials for what's coming next. But The uh, Ultimate Bret Warrior. I'm ready. Uh, the Wrestling Lowdown Show says only person is only one who actually retired until cluster match at Ground Jewel. Yes. Oh, uh, the they infamous. made sure not to touch on that. Yeah, I wonder why. I wonder why. Um, Rambo77.619 says that sums the, the state of modern day wrestling. Do you think an HBK would have pulled something as effing goofy as that uh on an old timers doc in the 90s he would have been mocked uh for it more like wrestling sucks <laughs> damn okay i love i love how heated some of these comments get <laughs> Uh, wrestling no doubt taking our, our recommendations and they're going to check out the stone cold one and i think uh rambo explaining his former combat saying zombies he didn't enjoy uh the zombies at wrestling at wrestlemania backlash uh and rachel agrees with him saying embarrassing and uh they uh rachel says I think she's talking to you, Romeo. She said you could do the anonymous raw general manager and just read read her. No, thoughts on she's H talking about um, she's talking about Miss P three. Oh, Miss P three. There you go. There you go. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. I I like that. That that'd be cool. But yes, that is all for our our live chat. You can keep on coming in. We still gotta go over what was our MVP. LVP and how we rated the A and E biography Shawn Michaels documentary here. Romeo, you want to kick us off and give us your MVP for this episode? I had two MVPs here. Uh, one for the first half, Marty Jannetty, and one for the second half of this uh, documentary, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. I thought they were both pretty good. Yep, I'm gonna go with. I'm also gonna go with the co MVP Triple H. Uh, deserves it because of you know learning more and more about how close knit their relationship was, how much uh, Triple H was really like a a person to kind of prop up uh, Sean and be his caretaker at times when he really needed it, and then his contributions to the documentary itself. He definitely deserves honors as an MVP. And my co MVP is not Marty Jannetty because he was too much grinning about coke use and partying a little bit too much for me. I'm gonna I'm go. So with, I'm gonna go with Rachel's favorite, Bret Hart, and see she agrees. Bret Hart MVP. Oh, shocker! She <laughs> so, also corrects me and uh, says you're right. She was like, she's talking about your wife. Then she doesn't need to be on camera. That is a good idea. Maybe we could. We I'll talk to her about that. LVP for this episode um, of Annie Biography, Romeo. I, you know, I didn't know uh, if there was anyone uh, worthy of it, but I'm just going to go, uh, this is kind of sad, Shawn Michaels for lying about not wanting to put over Brett at Mania 13. That's flat out lie. 
<gasps> Sean is the LVP yeah. for his own biography. <laughs> I'm going to go LVP. You know, I, I probably should go with the producers, but I'm going to go with the people that I feel like we should have got more from. And my co LVP is Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. I feel like these are two of Sean's biggest like friends. These are the guys that were with him during a lot of his trying times. Hunter was not there in like 94. He wasn't there for the early portion of 95. He, he was kind of just trying to like get intertwined with the click at the time of like, you know, for the rest of 95 going into 1996, I feel like Sh Scott and Kevin Nash, we could have got a lot more from them. So that's why I'm going to go with them as my LVP here. And, and then no one, two, three kid uh, missing uh, from this. Uh, no Sean Wantman at all. It was like, he wasn't even a part of the click. He, he's like, he's like Bret Hart in the, in the, in the Stone Cold Steve Austin documentary. Yeah. He didn't exist. He didn't exist. Um, so out of 10, what do you give our, the A&E biography, Shawn Michaels? Um, this is not a, okay, yeah, it is pretty biased. What I'm, I'm starting to bullshit like Shawn Michaels now. I give this a 9 out of 10. This is my favorite biography yet. Uh, they covered a lot more wrestling stuff than I, I thought in previous biographies. Uh, there was a lot of moments to revest. I almost didn't want it to end. I wanted them to talk more, more about, more of his wrestling moments, but, uh, Hunter was brutally honest in this. I really enjoyed that. Nine out of ten from me. Yes, uh, Hunter. That's what I said. Hunter. Hunter is our our agreed upon MVP out of our co MVPs here. We definitely agree. He was more honest than he's ever been with uh, any other documentary about Shawn Michaels. Um, last week I gave the Booker T documentary nine out of ten. I'm sorry, I'm once again going to have to do like I did with the Roddy Roddy Piper documentary and retroactively lower that score because that is more of an 8 out of 10 for missing out on the Booker T Triple H rivalry at WrestleMania 19 because they didn't want to make one of the executives look bad. So I'm going to have to give that an 8 out of 10. And I give this one an eight and a half out of ten. I thought that this was very well done. It was a it was a slightly better than uh, last week's episode with Booker T. Uh, it did cover a lot of his early career and uh, a lot of his early life, excuse me, and how he got into the wrestling business, how he created a love for professional wrestling. And I feel like they told the story of Shawn Michaels very well. I would have liked a little bit more of the second half of his career highlighted, but I understand the reasons why they couldn't. So eight, uh, eight and a half out of 10 is where I would go. We still are trying to meet the benchmark. I think I, I retroactively graded the Stone Cold one, nine out of 10. That's still the, the peak of these uh, A&E biographies, in my opinion. And Pratik, Gives it a 10 out of 10. He really liked the uh, a &E biography for Shawn Michaels. And I guess this is a question for me because Pratik, after this live stream is done for our a &E biography Shawn Michaels review, jump on over and click on our, our WrestleMania Backlash Roundtable review as Romeo and Top Guy JJ went through all the matches last night. They gave a star rating for each and every match, and they let you know what their match of the night LVP L. MVP and 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 out of 10 rating for the entire show was check that out if you want to know what Romeo thought but I will give you my favorite match for WrestleMania Backlash was Cesaro versus Roman Reigns great stuff by those guys and then we got Rambo saying trailer was better than the finished article he gives it a five out of ten wow mm, mm, tough <laughs> tough crowd here. and Rachel gives it a seven out of ten and she thinks Brett's will be great. Yes, I hope you join. Brett's will be a ten out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what it is, no matter what it is, for Rachel, it's gonna be a ten out of ten. I love it. I love it. I love how I love how we are standing for our favorites. That's what we love. We love you guys in the live chat. Thanks for watching us our live stream. You know, you can still send in. Said I got a question for you. Yes, let's hear it. Who from today's WWE roster, if you could have Shawn Michaels back for one more match, would you like to see against? Ooh, that's a very good question. I'm going to go Johnny Gargano. And it's only fitting that Johnny ended this episode uh, dancing to his theme song. <laughs> of course. 
Um, the first person I thought of was Adam Cole, but in retrospect, I'm going to have to go with AJ Styles. I feel like those two would be magic in the ring together. And I would have said what Rachel says. She said Danny O'Brien, but he's not on the current WWE roster. So I couldn't, I couldn't say yeah, him. But I had to got say, you there. Exactly. If I had to say anyone Roman in Reigns, retro- Cesaro, oh my God. Roman Reigns would be awesome, especially this this uh, iteration of Roman Reigns. That would be incredible. If I had to say anyone in wrestling, Hiroshi Tadahashi. I feel like Tadahashi and Michaels would be just psychology so, hey. and storytelling to perfection. And Sean could play the heel, so I think that would be that would be a great one. And um, I think he's saying uh. Brock Lesnar, Brock Lesnar, then Barrett can smash him up. <laughs> he says Brock Lesnar. So Michaels would get the absolute best out of Brock Lesnar. He definitely would. My question for you, Romeo, before we end things off, what is your favorite Shawn Michaels match of all time? Not the best, your favorite. Oh, boy. Yeah. WrestleMania 25, Undertaker. I know that's the easy answer, but I gotta go with that. That's my opinion. is the is the is the best. My favorite. It has to be between Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels. That's why I was so adamant about that. It's a three way tie, actually. Kurt Angle versus uh, Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 21. Shawn Michaels versus Chris Jericho at No Mercy, the latter match. Uh, I think. I think. By far, Shawn Michaels versus Chris Jericho is my favorite Shawn Michaels feud. So I had to name that. And then thirdly is one that is not really mentioned a lot. Shawn Michaels versus Jeff Jarrett from In Your House in 1995. Oh, my. Can I also add the, the Ric Flair match? Uh, just with the story. Shawn Michaels carrying Ric Flair through that. You know, just listen to me. And uh, wh- my personal favorite, yeah. Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair. Love it. We got another prediction. It says Volta versus Sean. Sean always did great with big men. And Volta, Sean would yes. never have another match after that one. That's for sure. And he says uh, uh, Sean uh, HBK versus Kurt. Uh, Mania 12 for his best. And he says HBK versus Hogan. Oh, man, that's another one they, oh, didn't, they didn't want to put Hogan on another A&E biography. That's probably why they missed out on that. <laughs> they didn't mention that one. <laughs> Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much to everyone for watching. Let us know in the comments section if you're watching us on demand, your MVP, your LVP, and how you rated the E&E biography for Shawn Michaels. Let us also know what you what you consider the best Shawn Michaels rivalry, the best Shawn Michaels match, and your favorite Shawn Michaels match. Let us know in the comments section. We want to thank everyone for watching. You, If you're watching us on YouTube, drop us a like. Share this video with all your wrestling fans, friends, and family on all your favorite social media platforms. If you're watching us on Twitter or Facebook, tag a friend in the live chat so they can watch along on demand for this A&E biography for Shawn Michaels. And Romeo, let the people know what we are going to be reviewing next Monday for the A&E biography. Shake the ropes. It's the ultimate warrior attack. Well, you know, that's a lot of dark stuff to get into as well. <laughs> and you know, we got to go to the flux capacitor and we're going to bring the plane down and we're going to review the A&E biography of the ultimate warrior. I think this can turn into a little bit of what they did to Macho Man. You think? I think again. Maybe not because the wife does work with WWE. Maybe. And they do have the Warrior War, but it has the potential. You never know. That is true. Romeo, tell the people where they can find you on social media. The Pride of NY, Twitter and Instagram. Check me out right here on the True Hill Heat YouTube channel. If you like NXT, which Shawn Michaels has has his fingerprints all over, I do a little show called NX3 with my boys Chris G and Ness. We review NXT. Also, True Rewind, me, SP3, Drunk Guy JJ, Raw versus Nitro. We go back in time where we see plenty of Shawn Michaels, but maybe a bit too much sometimes. 
And also check out our Dark Side of the Ring reviews this week, I think. It's the collision in North, North Korea. And what else am I missing here? Rated Raw coming this week, our first episode, Rated Raw Superstars. You're going to see a lot of Romeo entering your screens, and you can see a lot of me, SP3. Follow me on Twitter, tr at TrueHeelSP3. You can see me tomorrow. Come wish me a happy birthday live, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. BST on Wrestling Daily. Go over there and subscribe to the Wrestling Daily YouTube channel. We are approaching 15K, and when we hit that, we will be on Quizzlemania for Quizzlemania War Games. So go over and support uh, support me on the Wrestling Daily YouTube channel as I celebrate my birthday with Stephanie Chase tomorrow. I'll be on Wednesday on the Power 4 TV YouTube channel with John Scott for Power 4 SP three and then back again on wrestling daily at 3 p.m eastern time 8 p.m bst with alex mccarthy for wrestling daily as we talk about nxt and the latest wrestling news and you will see me a lot right here on the true hill heat youtube channel like romeo said we got our dark side of the ring review live on friday we're going to be review reviewing the episode on the collision of north korea and of course on saturday every single saturday our weekly podcast true hill heat with myself top guy jj and miss chrissy love and of course go back and watch this past week's episode as me top guy jj and our special guest joe hubert of fightful wrestling talked about in Impact Under Siege, as well as WrestleMania Backlash. We previewed and did predictions, and I was over on Fightful Wrestling YouTube channel reviewing SmackDown this week, so if you didn't watch SmackDown, or you did, go over and watch me and Sean Ross Sapp and Jeremy Lambert review that show over on that great YouTube channel, and if you are still in the mood for WrestleMania Backlash material. You can watch my preview with Pete Quinnell over on Sports Keto Wrestling, and you can watch Romeo and Top Guy JJ review it on this here YouTube channel. So, like, comment, share, and subscribe for the Condesseur of Reporting, Mr. Romeo Anthony Colon. It is me, it is me, your true heel phenom, SP3. This has been our a &E biography for Shawn Michaels. We are signing off until... Next time.